this morning, O God, that we're gathered unto you. Unto you shall the gathering of all the peoples be. And Lord, today we're representing, O God, many nations, languages, and tongues, O God, various places of the earth, O God. We're gathered to, today in this place to give you glory, to give you worship and adoration. Father, we commit ourselves to you and we say thank you, mighty God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Take a seat. Praise God. Wonderful Lord. You know, uh, our Meet Him in the Malady theme has just blessed so many people, and uh, I'm certainly one of those people. And uh, Meet Him in the Malady, you know, I don't know what it's done for you, but I pray that by the time we finish, we're going to continue through the month of November in various ways and believe that God will do something in our hearts more and more and more. You know, I don't know if you're hungry. When you're hungry, you say, more, Lord. More, Lord. I want more, Lord. Somewhere there's something about being hungry for the good things of God and uh, our worship, what it looks like and why we do it. You know, meet him in the melody. Melody, you know, there's harmony and there's symphony and there's all kinds of unusual words you could bring around that if you like. Uh, Tempo. But meet him in the melody. Something sweet and something beautiful in that that God wants us to be involved in and participators of. Praise God. I've called this, this particular sermon, uh, Meet Him in the Fire. You know, there's a song we sing. I think it's, uh, the team have actually allocated that as a song, not because they knew what I was doing, but it's one of the songs. You know, there's another in the fire standing next to me. The message this morning is, comes from the book of Daniel. And uh, I'll just talk about chapter one, but then we'll get into chapter two a little bit deeper. But chapter one in particular has got a lot to do with, or chapter two, sorry, chapter has a lot to do with, uh, you know, different things that were happening in that particular era or season. Nebuchadnezzar is a, a king, he's actually named as a king of kings, and we know who the king of kings is. His name is Jesus, and he, he's our, our God, our strength, our, our savior, our healer, our deliverer, our provider, all those awesome and wonderful things that, Neb, uh, that God is, Jesus is. But Nebuchadnezzar is a type of, and he takes names to himself, and so others have done in history as well as being the king of kings. And, uh, so he, and in some ways, on an earthly term, you know, I don't think we should freak out because there are many kings on the earth, have been over the centuries, Millennia, uh, but there are kings that stand out above other kings, and then there's kings that submit to those kings, so they become the king of kings. But there is one that is a king over all kings. There's no escape, and uh, you know, in God's economy, He called us kings. Is that right? How do you know that? What did He say? Okay, it's written on His thigh. What's written on His thigh? Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So there must be a lot of other kings and lords around, and I think they might be in this room. That's what he calls us. We didn't make that name up to exalt ourselves, but he says, I'm the King of all kings. And uh, if we're born, once, once you're born again, you're born from the, from the earthly realm, you have human parents, and they may be all kinds of backgrounds, but once you are born again, you are born of the King the spirit of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So you are immediately take on the nature of royalty. Hence, uh, our, our church name, Royals Church, has, is not an accidental uh, word. So Nebuchadnezzar, in the, in the beginning at least, has a dream. He has an, a dream, it's quite an incredible dream, and he, he really puts a pressure on all the people around him, people that uh, he actually has related to in the past, and uh, believed that, you know, perhaps they could give answers, the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, etc. You know, he said, I want you to tell me what I dreamt, and then I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream. Interpretation could be, you could get around, but to tell you the dream that you had is pretty hard. I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty big, big and tall order. And it's a, it's a dream that he dreams that actually has... Uh, a, gold st a statue that starts off with a head of gold and the shoulders and arms of silver and bronze for the, for the chest and the waist and then legs of iron and then the iron and clay, ceramic clay mixed with iron for the toes or the feet. And uh, he sees a, a stone come out of the sky, out of the heavens and hits the feet and it shatters and everything just collapses in a, in a pile of 
rubble, but actual fact, the rubble actually becomes dust, and it says, and the wind blew it all away till there was no trace left of any of it, but the stone that hit the feet becomes a huge mountain. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He said, I need someone to tell me. He was really, really upset by the dream because he didn't know what it meant. And uh, ultimately we have, you know, he threatens to kill everybody. He's a real dictator. You know, Hitler would probably pale into insignificance with this guy. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. That Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the famous three that went in the fire. So he's ordered everybody's going to die if you don't tell me what the, what the dream is and the interpretation. So, I mean, that's pretty rough. I don't know what you think of rough is, but I think that's as rough as it gets. And they went to look for Daniel and those three friends of his to kill them because he wanted somebody to tell them the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel explains the dream to him, and he says, you are the head of gold, and so on. Then describes the other, other empires that would come. And ultimately, the empire that we are, we are living in the, in the birth of the final empire, the shortest empire that will last seven years, ruled by a global leader, the Antichrist. That's the Word of God teaches us that. And uh, it'll have, uh, its feet will be made, it's a, it's a, it's a union of iron and clay, which we know don't mix, and uh, it's, a, it's weakened by it, and it's not a strong union, and yet it is the final empire, and it's the shortest empire. The Roman Empire lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. Some even extrapolated to say it lasted a thousand years. It didn't quite last a thousand years, but it was a very long, long reign of the, of, uh, the emperors of Rome and what have you. So, all of those have come and gone, the empire of gold and silver and bronze and iron have all gone, but we have one left, and that's what he dreamt about, and he, was, he knew that it actually involved him, but didn't know how to deal with it, so he wanted to really put the pressure on people, and so finally, uh, there is, Daniel arises and says, ask for permission Give me a little bit more time. I will find out the meaning and I will come to you and I will tell you what you dreamt and I'll tell you uh, what the interpretation is. And he does that. And uh, it's, it's amazing that he actually can find out from God. And God is merciful. He cries out for mercy. God is going to kill everybody, all the best of the best in the land of Babylon. He's going to kill everybody. Will you be merciful? Will you help us? Teach me what it is so I can give it a real good answer. And he gives him the answer and tells him the entire thing, tells him the dream, tells him the interpretation, and, uh, and ultimately, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heavens, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them, you are the head of gold. So that dream that he had, he's identified, he said, you are the head of gold. The empire that the Nebuchadnezzar ruled and reigned over wasn't a modern empire like the modern world we live in today, but it was in many ways, far superior in the structure and how he reigned and how he ruled and impacted the known world of the day. That's why he was the head of gold. He also was very wealthy in gold. There was no shortage, it seemed, of gold in his day and so on. So there are many other kingdoms will arise after him, but they will be inferior to him. And ultimately, you know, this is not only historical because the feet and the iron and the clay speak of a day that you and I are living in and are watching the formation of the final empire. Whether you know it, whether you don't want to know it, uh, the mark of the beast, uh, the, the chip, whether it's a chip or a, a, some invisible tattoo, as some have suggested, the mark of the beast is going to be the culmination of this dream that he had. And we are in the day that we're living in. We will see an empire rise up like no empire has ever been seen to be global as this one is. This is truly global because in that day it was only the known world because there was much of the unknown world that uh, did not understand that. So Daniel is the guy that gives the understanding for it. And uh, towards the end of that chapter, Daniel and his friends are promoted. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. Bring an offering to an incense to Daniel. He actually fell down to worship Daniel because when you fall down, and you know, I'm going to touch on it a little bit later on, you know, you can fall down. There are people that fall down under the power of God. 
There are people that want to go down themselves. I sort of see the whole panorama. Some people like to go down because they want to go down. Some people go down really genuinely under the power of God. We call it slain in the spirit. But there is another going down that is even more important than both of those. And that is when you personally go down yourself to worship God. Flat on your face. You know, I've done that hundreds and hundreds of, maybe more, but at least hundreds and hundreds of times where I just felt prompted by God. Sometimes I've been right here, flat on my face, saying, God, I just want to bow. I want to, I'm not going to fall down, but it's like I am. I'm going down, and I'm going down, not for the count like a boxing ring, but I'm going down because I believe he's so high up that I am, I'm humbling myself before his presence. When you do it, you are humbling yourself before his presence. So he bowed himself down, prostrate before Daniel. Prostrate means flat out, flat face on the ground, hands out, and he's literally, I call it worshipping Daniel, and commanded that they should give him an offering and an incense to him. And so in that process, Daniel intercedes for his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Benmigo. He says, uh, and by the way, remember these guys are really great guys, and they all get promoted. I want you to remember that word, promoted. There is a day to be promoted, there's a day to be demoted. And we're going to look at that as we go. So we come to chapter 2. Paul and Silas, we've touched on Paul and Silas in the prison. I I believe that God is wanting to get something through to this church. And as I've been waiting on God, I felt like God saying, I gave you this message to reinforce that message. And it wasn't, you know, it's the panorama of messages we've heard from the various people who have been delivering here the word of God. So some part of this process, I believe God's wanting to say something. And many of you, if I say it like that, and I have been there as well, just so you know, I'm not talking to you like that, but I have been there as well. There's been times in the most difficult moments, you don't, your flesh does not want to worship. Anybody ever felt like that? Just me. Okay. Thank you very much. (laughs) When you don't want to worship is when you're going through the worst time of your life. And uh, there's principles in scripture that are completely opposite to that. You should worship even more in the worst possible moment of your life. You know, Paul and Silas, you know, in stocks. Stocks actually, um, in depending on which prison and how that was, but often they would have been sitting down with their feet in front of them with Blocks of timber locking down, bolted down, chained down, their feet in front of them, and their arms often chained to the wall behind them. And that's not a very comfortable position. Cold, horrible, all that sort of stuff. You know, bad moments. And God is, I believe the theme, I want to sow this at the very outset of this message. I believe God is wanting to sow into this house the theme of understanding. Uh, Get this through to your heart. If you're going through difficulties, it doesn't really matter what difficulties doesn't really matter at all. Your difficulty may be, you know, the big one for people is financial. They're going through, do you realize how bad? I can't pay this and I can't do, oh, I can't get this and I really need that. I need that job and I can't do this. All the things that are, I can't, you know. Um, But he said in his word, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why do I need strengthening? Because humanly I'm weak. But through Christ, I can do all things, but in your heart and mind, you repeat over and over, I can't, I can't, I can't. I don't have this and I can't have that. And, why do, and so we, we become moaners, groaners, and complainers, which is not actually conducive to a relationship with God. If you do that to your spouse long enough, you will turn them away. Moaning, groaning, and complaining. If you moan, moan, you know, anybody tell me what a moan sounds like? I thought I heard a cow back there. <laughs> you know, well, a moan is like a gro- moaning and groaning. They are similar and yet different. And ultimately complaining is put, when you put the sharp edge of words on what's really in your heart. You will cut relationships and you'll break them. You will do it. They didn't. You did it because of your attitude. You know, so you've got to learn to stop that sort of heart. Somewhere we've got to take on board that God is actually in relationship with us and he's for us and not against us, not against us at all. So you may be struggling financially and you need God to break through for you. Well, worship him. You know, you, you may, maybe your marriage or a relationship, whatever type that may be, 
may be under stress and strain, worship him. Thank God for the other person. Begin to pray for them. You know, the Word of God has numerous things we should do for other people. And uh, first thing is to forgive. Second thing is to bless. <laughs> Anybody like to do any of that? No? No. First thing is to, is to forgive. Second thing is to, is to pray for. Third thing is to bless. Anybody with me yet? Or we lost you along the journey? Can you get past forgiveness? Because if you can't forgive, you're stuck. You're stuck in a rut, which is a grave with the ends kicked out. Can't get out, you'll be in the grave or the rut for the rest of your life. Forgive to get out. Forgive, pray for that person, bless that person, okay? And begin to give thanks for that person. And you'll ch your heart will change and shift. So relationships, finances, it could be any, your ministry. Lord, I'm so sick and tired of this and uh, I'm frustrated with my ministry. I'm frustrated in what's not happening. Uh, maybe, you know, you want to be up here. We'll do what I'm doing. You maybe you think, oh, really? Why is he up there? I should be up there. You may be frustrated at whatever, or it may not be me. It could be a singer, musician, or it could be a circle leader. It could be any kind of leadership aspect within the church. Pastor, elder, you know, whatever it may mean. Somewhere... It could be like jealousy, can be all kinds of grievances about those things. But the best thing you can do is begin to worship God, who is your source and supply of everything and all things in your life. Amen? So Paul and Silas, they learned to worship in the most horrific circumstances of their lives. You know, worship is actually a really important topic in Scripture. You know, if I was to go back, I could go back to Moses, where Pharaoh finally, after a few plagues, said, okay, you can take the men and you can go out into the bush and you can worship and come back, but the women and children stay back. You know, there's always, hey, we're not, I don't want everybody to worship. If we're going to give in a little bit, we'll give in a little bit, but you won't even go too far. You'd certainly not go into the promised land. I'll keep you back where I want to keep. So the devil has always been about restricting your worship. Restrict your worship. You shall not sing in COVID. <laughs> you, you cannot sing. Anybody heard that one? That was about to be imposed on the church and the church leaders in Queensland said no. No. Because you can shout at the footy, but you can't sing in the church. Well, we're singing in the church. You know, the enemy will always want to bring about a reason why you should not worship. You know, that woman, you know, Jesus met the woman at the well. Was that last week? Is that right, Fitra? Was that your message? Yeah. The woman at the well. Well, that whole discourse was about where she was herself. She really, in her heart, wanted to worship God, but something in her was restraining her. She wasn't free to worship. That's why she's going at the midday hour to get water. I mean, I don't want to see anybody. And, you know, worship is not just a, my personal relationship with God. It, there's two parts of worship. One is me, I, and God. And the other part is us together worshiping. There are dynamics that are by God instituted and uh, God gave it to the church and he gave it to you personally and he gave it to the corporate worship. When we are in unity, when we come together and we worship God, something begins to shake and break in the heavenlies that we have no idea what is going on really unless he shows us specifically. But to know that something major is actually unfolding. That woman needed a breakthrough and the whole breakthrough wasn't about her husband or husbands or not her husband, or even though that was part of, hey, I get to know you're a prophet. It wasn't even about that. It was about worship. It ultimately came down to worship. It came out of her mouth. And she was no different to Paul and Silas. They were in a physical confinement, but she was in a spiritual confinement. She couldn't even live naturally within the community she was in. And so the, the difficulty should never determine your, uh, your worship to God. And yet some of you, I need to be very confronting, some of you have stopped worshiping because things got too hard for you. I'm not going to worship him. I'm not going to give him praise. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go to church because, because, because. I'm not going to, because he hasn't done what I told him to do. See, we've tried to make him our servant rather than our Lord. He hasn't done what I told him to do or I thought he ought to do and he didn't do it. Well, he hasn't done it in the time frame that I expected him to, so I will withhold worship. And if you do that, you do it to your own detriment. 
you know, that God himself, you will never harm him in that regard, but you will harm yourself. He designed worship to be the, the actual vehicle of breakthrough for your life. Precious Lord. So the image of gold, we know it was, you know, the head of gold was, was him, Nebuchadnezzar. But he, something shifted in his mind. See, arrogance and pride will cause you to elevate and exalt yourself above due season and above your place and position even in history. So he determined, oh, I'm only the head of gold. So he decided in the next, very next chapter, he orders the, the making of a, what, a, well, I'm going to call it what the, the 90 foot high statue, 27 meters high. That's three and a half times the height of this building. So that gives you some perspective of how high. We're talking, you know, considerable height here, at least um, probably eight or 10 stories high. So if you see a hotel, eight or 10 stories, he said, I want to make an image of me and make it of gold from the head to the toes. Because what he was really trying to say, prophetically, he was trying to change the word of God. God gave a vision, gave him the vision or the dream and gave him the interpretation. But he said, no, somewhere in my arrogance and pride of life, I want to be the beginning and the end of all empires. And I want my empire to go on forever. Well, it's not for him. There's only one who's got the empire forever. It's, the, it's Jesus. So he builds that image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and, six, and width six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. You know, he was a pretty sharp operator. To make a statue that big with gold, I don't know how much gold you need to make a statue like that. I don't know if it was a, like a, a, a shell empty on the inside, but, or if it was solid gold, but he made this statue on the plains of Dura. Special place, fertile green, green grass all around, majestic location. He didn't pick a desert location where there was no beauty. He picked one of the best locations as it were. And he said, I want, to set, I want that statue set up in the plains of Dura. And they did that. And uh, he sent word and gathered all of his leaders, satraps, administrators, uh, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to what he called the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he sent the word out. He said, I want all the leaders of my nation. I want you, all the leaders, not all the population, but every person who had power and authority, I want you to come. We're going to dedicate the most incredible eighth wonder of the world. I've built it for myself. It's in my image, and I want you to come to its dedication. No one knew the format of the dedication. So they came, I'm just shortening some of the words here, and all the officials, and they gathered together for the dedication of the image. Now, I don't know what you would think if, you, you know, somebody invited you to, hey, we're going to dedicate this building to the Lord, you know, and you turn up with excitement, oh, this is going to be a great day, it's all been, everything's beautiful, everything's been done, hey, we're going to have an exciting time, there's going to be food and drink, there's going to be music and celebration, and you don't know the format, but you turn up here. And you find out that it's very different. I stand up before you and say, today at my command, when the musicians on this band play, you will fall down and worship. And they think it's something, me. How many people want to run out the doors? Well, the doors are now being locked and there's guards there with guns. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do? Because the command is very, very strong. So he gathered them together in that place. Now, my, for those taking points, my first point is all people will worship. Some people say they won't. I'm an atheist, I'm a this, but all people ultimately, and just a big word, ultimately will worship. All people will worship. He sprung a surprise on them and uh, he gave them the conditions of when to worship. And at that time, you will hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music. So there must have been orchestras prepared for this. Something that is beyond our human comprehension. This is not some small show. This is the biggest show on earth. He's got musicians and he's got singers. He's got everything organized. This has taken months, if not years, to plan for the day. And finally the day arrives. And he said, when you hear the, all kinds of music, you will fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. 
Now all the high-ranking officials know what they're there for. They were brought in and you had to come in because you're a leader and you have to do something. You have to fall down, prostrate, like he did to Daniel in the previous chapter, chapter one. You have to fall down, prostrate before the gold statue, which represents him. That's what he thought of himself. He thought he was that big, come more big is the word. He come more big, he's only that big, but he come more big, he became really huge in his own head. And he thought, I am all the empires. How dare this God say that I'm only the head. I will change history by doing this. And I will maybe even impress the God of all gods and he will change history because I've done this. And I'll show him that because everyone will worship. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, burning fiery furnace. So everybody should fall down. If you don't fall down and worship, you will die. What a wonderful way to worship. So he's not, he doesn't care if it's from the heart or not from the heart. You will obey and uh, you will do exactly what I tell you to do when I tell you to do. How do I know when? I determine when you fall down. I determine when you worship because it will be when you hear the music and I will give the signal and the musicians will begin and oceans of people as far as the eye can see will fall down and worship. And how long will you stay there? Flat on your face until the music stops. Hmm. So at that time, when all, all, not some, but when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, <laughs> I think it's incredible, the nations that had come from around that he ruled over many nations and many kings and languages, they fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. If you don't know God, that's exactly what you ought to do. You're just going to do what you're told, even if you don't want to do it. Even if you hate it, you hate him, it doesn't matter. You will be obedient and you will worship me. You know, one of the messages, I'm thinking back, a uh, message around where Jesus was tempted by the devil. And the last temptation was, fall down and worship me. I'll give you all of the kingdoms. I'll exchange everything that you can see as far as the kingdoms go. Those kingdoms that were mentioned in that, in that dream, all those kingdoms, I'll give them to you. I'll give you everything if you will just do one act of worship. And he, and he didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. And the angels came and they worshiped the Father together. How beautiful is that? Because it was all about worship. You know, some of you haven't worshiped. You can't remember the last time you really worshiped. You come to church and you sing the song. Sometimes you may worship, but you haven't really had a life. I'm a worshiper. See, a worshiper can worship every, should worship every day. Should worship on your bed. When you wake up in the morning, first thoughts, Lord, I worship you. Driving your car, doing the dishes, whatever it may be, doing the yard. It may be something that you're thinking of, hey, what am I going to do? I'm going to worship God. I want to do it because I want to do it. No one forced me to do it. I'm not, it's not when the music plays or when the he says to do it and you can't and you should. And you, no, I'm going to worship because I want to worship. I come to church to do corporate worship with all of you because I want to corporately worship. I don't come because I have to. No one forced me and no one forced you. And I know that you've come also willingly. I want to worship. You want to worship. We want to worship together together but from a willing heart, not out of pressure and contrived worship. So they fell down and they worshiped the golden image. So point number two for the point takers, writing the notes, choose who you will worship. Because if you don't choose, somebody else will choose for you. Choose whom, whom you will worship. So Daniel's friends, the three that he got promoted, well, they disobey the king. Verse, uh, I could start perhaps at, uh, yeah, verse eight will do. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews, and they spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Listen to those words. Your image, who you are, your persona, O king, live forever. Because that's actually what was in his mind. I will live forever. I will deify myself, and I will get through this forever. 
what a, what a deadly time, some people would say, but it wasn't good. Oh, you, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image, and whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now, the fiery furnace existed, it is believed by most scholars, it was there in the same area, the pla- that same plains of Dura, close to where the mines were, the gold mines. So the gold wasn't far, the furnace wasn't far, so he chose the location really well. And he said, if anybody doesn't, you'll see the, you can see the furnace, it's an open furnace, open gateway, open doorway, you can see into it and it's burning hot. So if you want any, any convincing you should worship, just have a look at the fire. Anybody happy to look at the fire? Just look at the fire and you can choose. Choose you this day what you will do. Precious Lord. Wow. There are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury gave the command to bring those three young men. So they brought these three men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Because <laughs> he's full of fury. He's not like, oh, hi guys. Good to see you again. I remember promoting you just last month, last week. Oh, good to see you again. Oh, God, how high five is great. No way. He's full of fury. He's the king of kings. Wasn't, wasn't really good, is it? So Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them, is it true? Yeah. So he gives them an opportunity. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you notice that it's repeated over and over and over and over, all of the instruments in symphony with all kinds of music. And you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we have no need to answer you in this matter if that is the case our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king now it's a it's a clash we don't have, and one translation says, I don't know, we do not have to be careful in how we answer you in regard to this matter. You know, only people who have made up their minds whom they will worship. You must choose whom you will worship. There are many gods so called in this world, but you must choose whom you will worship. Because one day when the pressure comes on, and we are not living under pressure today, believe me, I don't believe for a moment we are really under pressure. There is a day coming in the final empire, the short empire, seven years. That day there will be pressure for those that are still here. I don't expect to be here and many others don't expect to be here. But if you are still here, you will then know what pressure is. And we'll come to that at the very end of the the message. So he gave them a second chance. He's like, this is embarrassing, but I'm going to give you one chance because I like you young fellows. You're really good for my kingdom. You've done well, but I'm going to give you one last chance. And they just said, we're not even cancel, eh, eh, uh, like careful to answer you in, at all, O oh, king. And uh, you, know, you can imagine what, what he's thinking. But they said, we'll finish off the statement. But, he, but if not, if God does not deliver us, in verse 18, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. We don't worship your gods because he had many gods. They believed in, in multiple gods in that day, plural, you know, plural number of gods. He said, I'm not going to worship your gods and neither will I bow down and worship the gold image because he was wanting to become one of the gods. Ultimately, that's the bottom line. He's, they are gods. You are making yourself God. You're, you'll go down in history as being a god. We will not worship you. So, History says, in verse 20, and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind, rope them up, chain them up, bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First thing is to bind. Second thing is to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. 
Then these men were bound, they did what they were told, bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and they were cast, just like it was come up, bind and cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, with had intensity, do it and do it now, the, the strongest men in the kingdom, big muscular guys, came and grabbed these three princes, Hebrew princes, bound them and threw them in. And the furnace was exceedingly hot. The flame of the fire killed the men, those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The flame that was, they heated up the, the furnace seven times hotter and it ties up with some aspects of purification of gold. There are seven temperature levels that you heat gold to, and each level, the temperature gets rid of certain, ev evaporates certain impurities out of the gold. And the second heating takes it to another temperature level, and it keeps keep it there till it evaporates other metals. And then the third level, and it takes out other metals, and fourth, and until. But so he said, heat it to the highest temperature possible. The seventh level, where it purifies the gold. But I want to tell you that this this fire that was heated seven times wasn't purifying the gold that was in the furnace, physical gold. It was purifying the motivations and the heart and the belief system of these three young men. They were, they were coming out. They went in and they came out as refined gold to the seventh level. Pure gold. These men, and you know what? There should be something in every heart here today that you should desire to be pure gold before God. Pure gold, that means valuable in the kingdom. Somewhere God wants you to be valuable. He wants, he put value in you. Word of God says that he said, I put treasure in earthen vessels. That means you're carrying something of incredible value inside this earthen vessel. <coughs> Excuse me. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste. And spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast in three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O God. In other words, you know, it's a bit of like that Irish joke. Anybody, maybe not be an Irish joke, make it an Albanian joke, okay? They went for a job and, the, and they asked him, I said, look, if you want this job, you got, can you, are you good at mathematics, you know? Yes, I am. Can you count? Yes, I can. Well, count for me. And he said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He said, can you count any higher? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. So Nebuchadnezzar was doing one of those things. Did we not throw three men in the fire? One, two, three. Like, how simple can you be? Three, he's a king. He knows how many he threw in the fire. True, O oh king. They all agree. Yes, true. <laughs> Everybody agrees with him, whether it's true or false. Verse 25, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. You like that? The fourth is like how he ever knew that he looked like, somehow had the visage, the image of the Son of God. Somewhere he saw Jesus in the midst of the fire walking with them. Now I wanna say something to you. The word walking, I don't think is like this sort of thing. Because yeah, in the fire, our human thinking would think that uh, them would have been sort of miserable and sad, like we're in the fire. So it's just, oh, the, you there, Shadrach? Yeah, we're just walking around in the fire. I want to tell you that I don't believe that for one little minute. I think they were dancing with Jesus. They were whirling and twirling and jumping and shouting. What were they doing? They gave the, see, the topic was about worship. Just like it was when Jesus was tempted about worship, the angels came and they ministered to him. And what did we teach on that? They worshiped together the Father. Now we've got three young men that are being tested to the highest level, seventh time over the heating process. And Jesus turns up in the fire with them. This is miraculous and you should not try this at home. <laughs> Some of the programs say that, don't they? When you're watching something, don't do this at home, you know. Well, don't, don't go trying this at home. But this was something orchestrated and God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to do what he did. But Jesus turns up and the very thing that Nebuchadnezzar wanted, I want you to hear this, the very thing that he was demanding that he would get worship 
And they refused and they said, no, we will worship our God and him alone will we worship. Their God turns up in the fire, so what do you think they're doing? They're worshiping in the fire. There's another in the fire standing next to me. Is that it? Another in the fire. Hallelujah. No matter wherever I will be, doesn't matter where I am, in the fire, in the deep water, wherever it is, he's, he turns up. You know, when he went through the Red Sea and the Red Sea stood up on heap, it says, you know, some people want to say different stories and, you know, it was low tide, high tide and one, you know, one church service, it's a recorded sort of moment where the pastor did not believe in miracles, any miracles. He said, everything has a natural explanation. And he said, when those uh, Israel went over, they walked over on, on you know, low tide, uh, you know, ankle deep water, even though the Bible says there was dry ground. And uh, he said, oh yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was that kind of day. It was the low, low tide. You know, you get the extra low tide, like you get a, uh, what do you call it? The super high tide, what do you call that? King tides. Well, you get also the opposite. You get low tides that go really, really low. And so it must have been low tide. And, that's a, they, and, and this lady starts praising God in the back of the church. Praise you, Jesus, praise you. And he was so, for, for the miracles that you did. And she's going like that. And he stops preaching. He says, what, are you, what miracle are you praising God for? Oh, how he drowned the, the Egyptian army in six inches of water. You know? Yeah. No. The water, it's estimated when they went through the Red Sea, was up to what we in feet, 900 feet, or about 270 meters high walls on each side as they went through that miraculous escape out of Egypt. Supernatural, praise God. So I see four men loosed, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. Now, that's where the other people died. Remember that? The people who threw them in, they died. Their bodies are still there. And Nebuchadnezzar goes near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the midst of the fire and the satraps, the administrators, the governors, and the king's counselors all gathered together and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. That now, see, everybody, this was a public demonstration. He said, if you don't, you got three men out worshiping, whether it be 10,000 or 100,000 people gathered for the big event, I want you to watch what happens to people that don't worship. So into the fire, but this backfired, like that word, backfired, because they come out of the fire and the hair is, an, his hair is the first thing to go in a fire. Instantaneous, it, it just it gone, evaporated. Hair, the hair isn't singed, their clothes aren't burnt and there is no, not even smell of smoke and there are tens of thousands of people watching this. They're all gathered and saying, my goodness, what's gonna happen now? Well, something's gotta happen. Point number three is what's going to happen. Number three is you lead and others will worship. You lead, others will worship. If you lead, others will worship. But if you don't lead, if you don't stand up, be bold and courageous in the right time, the right place, under the leading and the inspiration of the Spirit. If you don't, others won't. It's, it's going to impact so many other people, your life. And you may think that you are insignificant and your life as a Christian, as a worshiper, doesn't mean much. I'm just a somebody doing a little bit of nothing, you know, just to get by until it's all over. And I hope I can get to heaven. I got my ticket, a one-way ticket, and I got my fire insurance, so I don't want to go to hell and burn. I just want to get to glory. You know, that is such a shallow approach to something so deep and so real, because you were born. You know, when uh, these instruments up here, maybe a couple of musicians should come right now, as quick as you can. You know, over here, as they come, We've got a keyboard, and the keyboard, it's not on, but if it was on, I'd be hitting some notes. It was created, somebody should turn this on. Can you turn it on? Turn it on, turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. You know, this instrument here, it's a mini guitar, is it? We call it mini? Why are you playing the mini when you're so big? <laughs> Praise God, big boy. Who knows? You need a big guitar. <laughs> it's the only one. It's the only one. 
This thing, somebody formed and fashioned it. They made it out of the, they got the right timber. They treated it. It was at a certain temperature and so on. And someone formed and fashioned it and they made it. And somebody else made the strings, but they're flexible. They're not like rods of steel. They're strings of metal. And somebody else made the tensioner and somebody else made the strap. But you know what? That guitar can do nothing unless somebody, somebody gets behind it and starts to play like a musician can play. Hallelujah. Same goes with this one. What about the drummer? You know, that just gives us a bit of a drum roll and a few little beats there. This thing, keep going. The, all of that whole setup was made for a purpose. Wasn't made just for fun. Wasn't made for the rock and roll bands. Wasn't made, you know, for the world famous people, or musicians or singers. They were made to worship God. All the instruments and that keyboard. Now, have you got any music on that? Just give me a few runs on that. Now I want everybody to stop. Stop. <laughs> you notice that until people, people got behind the instruments, nothing happened. It was all silent up here. Just really low, low, low behind me. Just start again. It's when people got up behind the instruments and they began to make the sound they were created for. And they were created for this and that and the other. And together they make a symphony of sound. They make a melody, they make a harmony. They do everything when they are woven together like a tapestry. Tapestry doesn't happen unless someone's got a picture before they even start and they begin to weave all the threads of cotton and colour. And by the time they finish, a picture emerges. Somebody had the revelation. Somebody had the picture in their hearts and minds. Somebody knew what it would look like and God determined that He would weave together the singers and the musicians and the drums and the keyboards and guitars and everything else. That's why He said that everything that has breath, let it praise the Lord. Hallelujah, softly, softly. Hallelujah. God created you to worship. You're looking at them. You're looking at instruments, watching singers. But I wanna say to you today emphatically, you are created from the top of your head to the tips of your toes to worship Him and Him alone, to give Him glory and honour and praise every day of your life. Hallelujah to the King. Mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You were made and created to worship. You were made and created to worship. Worship, worship, worship the King, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the world were laid. The Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, worship, worship, worship Him and worship Him. Of God slain before the foundations of the world were laid. Oh, we will worship Him. We will glorify. We will magnify. We will give every breath to Him. We will lift up our voices and to Him and to Him alone and no one else. We will worship Him. We will worship Him. We will give Him the glory. We will give Him the praises. We will give Him the thanksgiving with all of our lives. Under the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You were made to worship. God gave you a voice to worship. He gave you breath in your lungs to worship Him. To magnify Him. He gave you a mind to think and be creative and to worship Him. He gave you a heart to conceive every good thing, to worship Him.
to give him glory and honor and praise glory and honor and praise to the king of kings to the lord of lords we're here to worship him 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 hallelujah we're here to worship we're here to worship Him. 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 We're here to magnify. We're here to glorify. We're here to lift up Your holy name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! 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 Glory, glory to the Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the world He's worthy He's worthy Yes, worthy Worthy is the Lamb Worthy is the Lamb Worthy, worthy, worthy Worthy is the Lamb You know, in some ways, as I'm even saying that, we demonstrated that right here. I led something with the team and you followed. But that's just in this setting. But when you worship, you can lead so many more. Your, your life of worship should not be a hidden life of worship. These young men, they were openly worshipping God. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God. He's changed his tune. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any God except their own God. They said they'd rather die than worship another God. This guy hasn't been born again. He's not saved. He's not spirit-led. He's still a dictator. So listen to the next words. Therefore, I, that's King Nebuchadnezzar, make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss or against the church of the God or the, of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Now, I'll kill you if you don't worship the golden image. Now, I'll kill you if you don't worship their God. He's still a dictator. He hasn't changed by nature but he's recognised that God arrested him. And then the king, it says, promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Babylon was the most prosperous, most powerful uh, province in the entire world of that day. And he promoted these three Hebrew young men to places of prominence. The story is, he promoted them at the beginning because Daniel asked them to. And he said, I'll take your word. Yes, I'll do that. And then he demoted them to the fire. And then he promoted them to, the, to be leaders in the province of Babylon. They would never have been leaders in the province of Babylon ever again had they not worshipped the true God. Had they not said, we will never bow, we will never change, we will never do this any further. You know, promotion, the Scripture says, comes from the Lord. The last little bit of this story in Revelations, if you want to take notes, 13, 12, Revelation 13, 15, and Revelation 14, 11, it says something of the final phase of what the world will face. 
Revelation 13, 12, and he exercises, that's the Antichrist, all authority over the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. His deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13, 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. There will be an image, not a person. There will be a created image of something that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Same, same spirit then, same spirit at the end. And Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and who receive the mark of his name. There is something coming at the end of the age and if you don't know much about it, you ought to get busy finding out about the day we're living in, some of the most momentous days in the history of the world. Upheavals of every description and every side, political and economic and medical and pandemics and all sorts of things that are going on. Earthquakes, volcanoes, you know, cyclones, whatever. Many of them have happened before, but they are ever increasing in our generation, more than ever in the history of the world. And it'll culminate in a final empire, a one world order that will rule the earth. And there's a global president, global leader, king, if you like. He will say that he's king of kings and lord of lords and no one should worship the God that we worship in this house today. It'll be banned in that season. In those seven years, you will not be able to do it if you're still here. So it's important that we learn to worship him now. I believe God is saying worship, no matter what your circumstances, Whatever your circumstances, it's not just worship. I think I can add the word praise. I say thanksgiving, praise and worship is a threefold cord that is not easily broken. When you wind those three together and make a rope, three parts, three, three cords to make one rope, it's not gonna be broken. You've got something of an anchor in the throne room of God. Hallelujah. Give Him thanks for everything in your life. Give Him praise and give Him worship. Glorify the God of heaven, hallelujah, for He is worthy. He's worthy, He's worthy, He's worthy. These three young men, ultimately they died of old age from what we understand, but they had a story to tell and their story still speaks to us today. They're still telling us something. Daniel stood his ground in the lion's den years and years later. He would face the, 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 the same threat of death the lions are going to eat you alive. But well, God sent His angel and shut the mouth of the lions. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, we're going to burn you in the furnace. Burn us in the furnace. But we will never bow. <laughs> we will never bow. Never, 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 never bow. We will worship the God of heaven. The only true God of heaven. Thank you so much for joining us here on Royal's YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if this has blessed you, feel free to share it with your friends and family. We can't wait to see you next time for another glorious gathering.